introducing you to introducing you to managing this pain. So my name is Dr. Esther Mwinga. I work with Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association. And today we are privileged to have our speaker, Dr. Esther Nafula, who is a pain and palliative care specialist and currently heading the pain and palliative care unit at the Kenyatta National Hospital. Dr. Nafula, uh, feel welcome and take us through your presentation this afternoon. For our attendees, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please feel free to put them in the Q&A section and we shall be responding to you at the end of this uh, session. So Karibu Dr. Nafula and Karibuni uh, participants. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this privilege to do the presentation today. I hope you can see my presentation and you can hear me clearly. Yes, yes, we can, Esther, go ahead. So this afternoon, we want to look at acute pain management. We've talked a lot about chronic pain, but it's good for us to also know how to manage acute pain because this is the commonest presentation, especially in outpatient departments. So acute pain is generally the body's way of saying that something is wrong, and it can be associated with internal or external damage or dysfunction. So scientifically, it has been defined as a complex and pleasant experience with emotional and cognitive as well as sensory features occurring in response to tissue trauma or tissue damage. So pain is very subjective and it's multidimensional. So even acute pain, as much as patients will present with the physical aspects of pain, we have to look at the psychological, social, economic, uh, factors that are associated with the pain. We have to look at it in a multidimensional way so that we are able to manage it well. And some patients will present with acute pain in the background of chronic pain, or they have had experience with different pain and they've been on analgesics for a long time. So these are some of the things we are going to discuss this afternoon. So acute pain is generally thought to last for about three months which is the normal time that is associated with tissue healing. So after three months, we stop considering that as acute pain and it becomes chronic pain. So acute pain causes a lot of suffering to the patient physically and emotionally. It is associated with neuronal remodeling. So if we do not treat it properly, it can result in chronic pain or complex pain syndromes. So again, the degree of pain is often related to the degree of tissue damage or the kind of tissues that are affected. For example, a patient with a fracture will, will feel more severe pain compared to a patient who has soft tissue injury. So acute pain will resolve with normal healing. Uh, most of the time it is easy to pinpoint the cause of the pain because there will be an obvious injury, a disease process, surgery, procedure. So it is very easy to say that this is the cause of the pain. So again, a lot of acute pain will be nociceptive. By the time we are having neuropathic pain, that pain is chronic. Acute pain, the pathway is nociceptive. So I will not go into the pathway of nociceptive pain, but I will just mention in passing what it is. So nociceptive arises from noxious stimuli. So for example, when a tissue, there is trauma to tissue or there's exposure of, uh, of um, injury to the tissue, there's stimulation of what we call nociceptors. And then uh, the commonest mechanism of pain. So it is classified according to the affected tissue. Superficially, we have uh, somatic pain. So it can be superficial or deep somatic pain that can affect either the skin, ligaments, tendons, bones, or muscles. And then visceral pain would affect internal or hollow organs. So some of the common types of acute pain or how we can classify acute pain can be based on the cause. So we've already classified nociceptive pain as somatic or visceral, but then we can come and look at what is the etiology of the pain. So we can have pain due to acute illness, 
and you would therefore quantify which illness the patient has presented with. Are they having an appendicitis, a renal colic, a myocardial infarction? So the pain is secondary to the illness. Then we have perioperative or postoperative pain that would come following a procedure, surgical procedure. We could have major or minor trauma. So for example, patients accident can get major trauma. Patients from sport, sports can get uh, minor trauma like sprains and lacerations. Even after a fall, someone can get minor trauma. Then we have burns. Burns come from fire or chemical burns and they cause uh, acute nociceptive pain and later can cause neuropathic pain. Then we have procedural pain. This, uh, this is pain that will be experienced following a medical procedure like a bone marrow aspirate, a chest tube insertion, endoscopy. Then we have following delivery, whether it is uh, vaginal or cesarean delivery. Still, the cesarean delivery can be classified as postoperative pain, but it can also be looked at as obstetric pain. Uh, next month, we are going to be looking at managing pain in pregnancy. So part of this obstetric pain will be discussed and you'll understand why we are putting it differently from just acute illness or procedural or perioperative pain. The management is a little bit different when we come to the obstetric population. So why we are discussing this, the goal of treating acute pain is we want to give early intervention because early intervention will ensure that our patient is comfortable and we will avert the situation of getting chronic pain in future. We want to be able to reduce pain to acceptable levels so that patients can be able to function and can have less physical and psychological distress. Then we want to facilitate recovery from the underlying disease or injury. Sometimes, for example, uh, patients with the uh, who are postoperative, we want them to ambulate quickly. So we need to manage their pain so that we can get them out of bed. So how do we approach the patient with acute pain? The first thing is to have a focused clinical assessment. We need to be able to take a detailed history that is aimed at controlling pain, uh, identifying the underlying problem, and then offering treatment. So after assessment, we want to achieve pain control, then identify potential underlying causes or diseases and offer specific treatment. We've said that this is pain that is going to go away when the healing process occurs. So we should be able to identify the illnesses and give treatment so that we can get our patients off analgesics quickly. And then the final bit is patient education. What do we teach the patient about their pain, about their analgesics? So we'll go through each of these uh, four sections. I think I'll spend about 10 minutes or 15 minutes most on each section. So last month, we talked about pain assessment. So pain assessment is very important. If you do not identify pain, you cannot manage it well. So you have to be able to assess the pain properly for you to be able to manage it. So in acute pain, we want to encourage evaluation of the pain in a systematic manner so that you are able to identify all the factors surrounding the pain. Use validated scales. So what, what, what we mean by this is that we have scales that have been researched and they have been recommended for use. So we want to use these scales to give us a baseline of where the pain is so that when we are starting analgesics, we can be able to evaluate and reevaluate the analgesics using the same scale. And we can also be able to evaluate whether the healing process is happening as expected. Use the same scale for the same patient during assessment and reassessment. If you have used a numerical rating scale, the next time you reassess pain for this, that patient, use the same numerical rating scale. Always document your findings at the time of assessment and reassessment of pain, and even the interventions that you've given. Or for example, if the pain is getting better, we might want to step down on the, pain, on the analgesics. If the pain is getting worse, we want to step up. Then assess the degree of expected or actual pain from injury, surgery, or procedures. 
So sometimes uh, patients might expect to experience pain and this actually interferes with the assessment. So if you, you, you've given your patient a consent form to sign that you're coming to do a bone marrow aspirate and the patient is already expecting that they are going to, to have pain, they might actually rate their pain as severe because of that expectation when the pain might be mild or moderate. So you need to gauge what your patient is expecting even before you do the, the assessment. What are they expecting in terms of pain? What are they expecting from medication or from procedures? So pain assessment can be easy and can be difficult. There are many factors that affect how patients rate their pain or even whether they accept to, to give you information about the pain. So the first thing is the type of injury or procedure. So as we've said, there are some injuries that will result in more pain than others. Even there are some procedures, for example, uh, open surgeries will be more painful than laparoscopic surgeries. Then we have the culture of the patient. So we have some patients who do not, we have some patients who do not um, express their pain in their cultures because either pain is thought to be part of illness or maybe their, their culture is that you need to bear pain and the best example is uh, women in labor will not say that they have pain because they expect uh, labor and childbirth to be a painful process. Now, in some cultures also, men do not express pain, so they will tend to underrate their pain or not to say that they're in pain at all because they are, they are expected to be brave and to brave the pain. Then we have the anatomic location of the pain. So which body structures have been affected? That will determine the severity of the pain and therefore uh, what the patient will report. We have history of alcohol and drug use. So this can affect our pain assessment because some patients when they're intoxicated, their pain perception will be lower. Then we have patients who are drug uh, addicts or they are misusing opioids. So they might also uh, rate their pain. For example, someone who wants to procure a prescription for opioids will rate their pain as severe because they know severe pain will come with an opioid prescription. There is history of anxiety or depression, history of analgesic use. If, if the patient is already on analgesics, uh, that might interfere with our pain assessment. Or as I've mentioned, the ones who are misusing opioids, might want you to change their, their medication. So they might want your prescription to be geared towards certain medications. Uh, previous history of pain. So our, our rating or assessment of pain, even on an individual level, is based on our experience of pain. So the worst pain you've ever experienced, if we ask you to rate your pain from zero to 10, you will quickly think about the worst pain you have ever experienced in your life and you will compare it to the pain you are experiencing at the time of the assessment. So it is good to also understand what the worst pain the patient has ever experienced is as they are rating pain for you. So when we are taking a history, the PQRST model is good to remind us of what to ask. So P is precipitating or palliating factors. This is aggravating or relieving factors. Then we have the quality of the pain. So the quality is where they will describe their pain as a dull, a dull ache, it is a throbbing pain, it is a shooting pain. Then R is for radiation, where does the pain radiate to? S is the site and severity. So where is the pain? Then how severe is it? And T is for timing and treatment. So what time does the pain come? Does it have a pattern? When does it get worse? What analgesics has the patient tried and where did they get them from? Were they over the counter? Are they leftover medicines of a relative? Were they prescribed? And what is the experience with that treatment? And also how is the patient taking the pain medication? Is it as prescribed or is it uh, whenever necessary? So the scales for pain assessment are either self-rated, self-reported or behavioral scales. 
So the patient who is able to communicate with us, we want them to rate their own pain. The ones who are not able to communicate, we want to look at their behavior and we look at their vital signs, we look at their behavior and we are able to rate the pain. So I will mention these scales because the detailed presentation of pain assessment was done last month. And in case you missed it, it is on our KNH website under the webinar section. So some of the scales we have is the numerical rating scale, which is a scale of zero to 10, where zero is no pain and 10 is the worst possible pain. Uh, on, on, on the right side of your screen is the visual analog scale, which again is a 10 point line with zero meaning no pain and worst being the worst possible pain. For the visual analog scale, the patient will, will choose a point on the, on the scale whether their pain is closer to zero or to 10. The numerical one now has given it value. So one to three is mild, four to six is moderate, seven to 10 is severe. Sometimes we get uh, children above three years who are not able to count. We use the Wong Becker scale, and we use this also for illiterate adults where there's a face. Again, there's a smiling face for zero and a crying face for 10. So they choose the first that corresponds to their pain. Again, for illiterate adults, we can use the hand scale where we use uh, from a fist. A fist is zero, no pain. One is uh, mild, one and two are mild. Three is moderate pain and then four and five is severe pain. So again, you explain to the patient how to use this scale and then you use the scale for them to give you the severity of the pain. Now, when taking a history for acute pain, it is very important to assess the risk of opioid misuse prior to prescribing any pain medication. And the reason for this is we will see in the strategies of managing acute pain that we want to use opioids for a very short time. Now, some patients who uh, have opioid misuse disorder, will visit outpatient departments or emergency rooms trying to look for opioid prescriptions. So it is good for us to take the history. Does the patient have history of drug abuse? Any other drugs except opioids? Have they been exposed to opioids? How do they use them? Are they prescribed? Is there a history of mental illness? Is there a family history of alcohol, drug, or opioid misuse? So even within the family, because a lot of people who misuse opioids, actually 40 to 50 percent is estimated that their first exposure to opioids is from leftover medications of a relative. So a relative has pain, then you come and say, I have a hip, oh, my knee is aching, and they tell you try this medication, and you try, and it works for the pain. So then a lot of these patients start to misuse opioids because in the first place, if they were not properly prescribed. So that is about assessment. So remember to take a very focused history and to assess the risk of opioid misuse in the patient. And then now the second bit is about achieving pain control. Now, when a patient comes in with pain, you need to manage their pain first before you start uh, interrogating them further. Because sometimes if a patient has very severe pain and you're trying to ask them, uh, rate your pain on this scale, what is your experience of pain? The patient might actually become harsh towards you because they are, they are suffering. And some of them will ask you, I'm in pain and you're asking me too many questions. So we need to manage their pain as soon as possible and then take the detailed history. So when we are choosing analgesics, it's important to, to consider a few things. For example, the age of the patient, are they above 65? Are they children so that we, we know how to calculate their doses? Do they have hepatic or renal impairment that is known already? Uh, part of the baseline assessment, when we are doing our investigations for underlying medical conditions, it is good to have hepatic and renal function tests, but you might get patients who already present with the impairment. Uh, for patients with hepatic and renal impairment, we do not encourage the use of NSAIDs. We, we prefer opioids, but then the doses have to be adjusted accordingly. We have comorbidities. 
what other medical conditions is your patient suffering from and what are the potential drug interactions? Is the patient on blood thinners? Uh, is the patient on antihypertensives? Is the patient on um, hypoglycemics? So we need to know that so that when we are prescribing, we can, we can choose the correct analgesic. Then history of substance or opioid abuse, we've mentioned that. Then where there is co-administration with CNS depressants like sedatives or anesthetic agents, it is important to be able to work with the anesthetic team so that we do not give patients medication that will compromise their neurological function further. So the WHO has developed a pain management ladder that is a three-step pain relief ladder. This ladder was actually developed in 1986 for management of cancer pain. And because it worked very well in reducing the, the experience of pain for cancer patients, we have adopted this ladder for use in pain management. So remember for acute pain, the aim is not to get to zero pain but to make it tolerable because there is an underlying tissue damage that has to go through the healing process. So sometimes you may not be able to eliminate the pain to zero, but you can get the patient to a functional status. Maybe if their pain was 10 out of 10, we want to get them to a pain that is three out of 10, which is bearable. So in a pain, the analgesic ladder will go up or down the ladder. We can step up or down. And then a fourth step has been included. There is an adaptation of this ladder now to include a fourth step, and this is applicable in acute pain. So the three-step ladder starts with step one, which is for mild pain. So remember, after you rate your pain, you will document and say the patient rated their pain as mild, which is three, maybe two or three out, out of 10 in the numerical pain scale. So after you rate the pain, you come and check which step of the ladder you need to start at. So for step one, we have uh, non-opioid or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pain analgesics, which would be paracetamol and our NSAIDs with or without an adjuvant. For step two, we have weak opioids, which would give us our, in our setup, we have tramadol, codeine, and dihydrocodeine. Then step three would give us a strong opioid where we have uh, morphine, fentanyl, and methadone in our setup. Now, the adjuvants that we use in acute pain, most of the time are either topical air agents or local anesthetics. Because as, as we mentioned, the pain pathway, the other adjuvants like anticonvulsants, antidepressants are more useful in managing neuropathic pain, which is a type of chronic pain. Now, the three steps is uh, non-opioid or NSAIDs, weak opioids, and then strong opioids. So what happens in acute pain is that we can start at any, st any step of the ladder, depending on the severity of the pain. It is not that we need to go from step one, two, as we climb up. For example, a patient who has come from a road traffic accident and has polytrauma, that patient will be in a lot of pain and might need us to start with strong opioids. Then once we've sorted out the, um, the fractures, maybe any pleural effusions that are there, I'm, I mean hemothorax or pneumothorax, then we, we might now step them down to weak opioids and then NSAIDs. So there is room to step up or down the ladder because acute pain, we expect the pain to get better as healing happens. Now, step four is interventional pain management. And that is going to be a presentation in this pain management series. We are going to look at when do we give interventional pain management. Hello? Sorry. So we want to look at when do we give interventional pain management? Because the, the sooner we give it, the better. We do not want our patients to have chronic pain. So the, the, the interventions that have been recommended include nerve blocks, epidurals, patient-controlled analgesic pumps, 
neurolytic block therapies and spinal stimulators. And uh, when we do the presentation on interventional pain management, we will see which ones exist in Kenya. So there's a point you can give your patient strong opioids. Maybe you've combined with NSAIDs and you've, you've done your best, but then you feel that uh, the patient's pain is not getting controlled. So we will want to, to consult the anesthesia team so that we can be able to give these interventions early before the patients complicate to have chronic pain. Some patients post-surgery can be given regional blocks. They can be given epidurals or, or, or these uh, analgesic pumps that will actually help to control their pain and keep you off from prescribing the strong opioids because for postoperative pain, we expect that in about three to four days, the pain will have resolved to moderate pain and the patient will only need weak opioids maybe for three days and then we can, we can go to end. So this uh, step four actually helps us to avoid the opioid crisis of having to keep our patients on opioids for prolonged periods of time when they have non-cancer pain. Now, uh, you've seen from that ladder that we, we are using multimodal analgesia. There's, uh, it's very useful to combine analgesics because they work on different pathways. So when we, we use different drugs, we are able to get better pain relief. For our postoperative patients, they're able to ambulate faster. And a lot of this medication can actually be taken orally. We will be able to discharge our patients from hospital early so that we do not have prolonged hospital stay. So NSAIDs, I'll go back to the slide of the ladder. NSAIDs can be combined with the weak opioids or strong opioids. So they can be used at any step of the ladder. So sometimes when we are controlling pain, especially acute pain, we want to use minimal opioids. So it is very wise to combine the opioid and the NSAID so that uh, we can have two mechanisms of pain control. So for pharmacologic interventions, we've said that acute pain is often nociceptive. So it will respond to both NSAIDs or non-opioids and opioids. And local anesthetics are the common adjuvants. So mild to moderate pain responds well to NSAIDs and paracetamol. Where the patient does not have contraindications to NSAIDs, we can choose any NSAID that is available considering the gastrointestinal side effects or renal side effects, then paracetamol. Moderate to severe pain needs opioids, but in acute pain, this should be used at the lowest doses and for shorter durations. We do not want to have the crisis that is happening in the West of opioid misuse. So we need to be able to limit the amount of opioids that we are prescribing for acute pain and focus more on managing the underlying condition so that our patient is not in pain. And where we feel that the patient needs opioids for a long time, we can consult the pain management specialists in anesthesia and see if the patient can benefit from interventional pain management. So in the outpatient unit, we have patients who need opioids. So we are not saying that do not give them opioids. The risk of abuse is lower in acute pain compared to chronic pain. But again, the commonest problem with acute pain patients is that they do not finish their dose of opioids. So they, they use the remaining pills inappropriately or divert those pills. So what we mean by diversion is they will give it to their relatives. Some of them will sell off those medications. So we need to give opioids for a short time. So when there's a clear indication, aim to use short-acting opioids. For example, in the outpatient setups or in trauma patients, we we'll even prefer to use fentanyl. In the past, pethidine was being used because it is short-acting compared to injections. Use the lowest effective dose. Use the opioids for a short period. So we encourage that in acute pain, let us aim to use opioids for just about three days. Because within three days, we expect that we have identified the underlying problem, we have started definitive management, and because it is nociceptive pain, we are able to step down to 
NSAIDs or other methods of managing pain that is not opioids. Where the patient might need opioids for longer than three days, please refer them for pain management appropriately. We have a pain clinic in Kenyatta and some of our facilities in Kenya also have uh, pain clinics. So we can be able to refer this patient appropriately. Then assess the patients for opioid misuse or other addictions because uh, patients who have opioid misuse will need higher doses of opioids. And again, we, we want to be able to assist the patient as much as they have come in with pain. If we identify that they have opioid misuse or other addictions, we should be able to refer them for appropriate mental health care. Avoid using long acting or sustained release opioids in acute pain. Uh, we will look at, at uh, how to prescribe opioids for acute pain. Then re refrain from refilling chronic opioid prescriptions. So patients with chronic pain should be followed up properly in pain clinics and should not be coming to the outpatient to get their opioids refilled. Again, there are patients who will come and say, my prescription is lost, was stolen, it was destroyed. We need to be wary of this. This is a red flag because patients who misuse opioids will go from different hospitals trying to get opioid prescriptions. So when necessary to use opioids in acute pain, prescribe the amount that is expected to cover the pain or a realistic duration of time. If it's post-operative and we look at the extent of the procedure, we know this patient might be in pain for one week. So we need to prescribe the opioids maybe for four days and then step her down and go to insane. Screen for risk factors of substance abuse, use short-acting opioids. Then discuss with the patient's safe storage use and disposal of opioids. I am not sure whether we have a return policy for opioids in Kenya, but maybe the pharmacists who are in attendance can tell us because there are some areas um, in the world that have uh, return. So if, if, you, if we've given you a prescription of opioids for three days and you've, you've, you've retained six tablets, we expect you to return those opioids to the pharmacy instead of uh, saying that the patient is going to dispose because we don't know how they will dispose those opioids or in whose hands those opioids will end. Then taper or discontinue the opioids as soon as is possible and reevaluate the patient if healing is not following the expected course. So if, if a patient is still having persistent pain uh, past the duration that we expect healing to happen, then we should be able to reevaluate and see whether the underlying problem has been sorted out and now whether the patient needs now management for chronic pain. Medications are not the only way to manage pain, but non pharmacological interventions also help. So, cold compress or ice packs can help in some types of pain, limb elevation, immobilization, physiotherapy, yoga hypnosis or guided imagery massage. These are some of the techniques that have been studied for managing acute pain. Then we have cognitive behavioral therapy for sometimes patients present with pain, but they also have some psychosocial factors. So when we identify this, we need to be able to link them up to proper psychological and social support structure. Now we are going to look at some specific populations that present uh, challenges when we are managing acute pain. So we have the postoperative patients. As we've mentioned, if, an, if pain is not treated postoperatively, there will be prolonged hospital stay. Uh, some patients can develop um, DVT or pulmonary embolism because of being in bed for long. There is uh, frequent hospital visits postoperatively as patients are complaining of unresolved pain. Again, this pain might transition into chronic pain if we do not manage it, and there is generally decreased quality of life and needless suffering for the patient. So the aim here is to relieve suffering and improve healing. So good pain control will help us to undulate our patient's faster. And postoperative pain is managed. It's one of the 
campaigns that is managed with a step-down approach. We start from a very strong analgesic as we go down to a weaker analgesic plus. Consider combination medicines. We've said we want to use opioids at low doses. So the best way to do this is to use a combination medication because these combinations come as a weak opioid with paracetamol. And again, we want to give them for a short period of time. Common combinations have codeine and paracetamol, tramadol and paracetamol. And you find, for example, if you look at a tablet of tramacetol, tramacet, they have only 37.5 milligrams of tramadol. And the starting dose for adults is 50 milligrams. So the combination medications give us an opportunity to use uh, very low doses of opioids and for a short time. And because the, the pill is already combined, there's no pill burden, there's better compliance for our patients and the side effects are not too much. For example, the patient will not get nausea or vomiting. They will not get drowsy from the opioid because it's a very small dose. So for postoperative pain, we advocate for use of combination medications. So the NSAID plus a weak opioid combined with paracetamol as they step the patient down. When we get opioid exposed patients, their pain management becomes a little bit difficult. Uh, I'm happy to say that this is one of the presentations that will come in July. Around June or July, we are going to look at how do we manage patients who have opioid misuse disorder. These patients, some of them, uh, have been exposed to opioids for a long time. They're using the opioids at a very high dose. You could get a patient who is even using one gram of pethidine in a day. That is way above the recommended uh, maximum dose in a day. So you need to know the type and quantity that the patient is using. Then you should be able to give an equianalgesic dose of opioids. So most of these patients will need a higher dose of opioids compared to opioid naive patients, and you have to prescribe the opioid. So it is good to know we have opioid conversion charts um, that are available in our drug indexes. So it is good when you, when you know how much opioids a patient is exposed to, you can come to these uh, charts and you can be able to convert and give them, uh, for example, if you want to give them morphine, maybe they've been abusing oxycodone, you want to know what dose have they been using in 24 hours and what is the equivalent dose of morphine. Because as much as they have an addiction problem or a misuse problem, we have to manage their pain because it's their pain that has brought them to hospital. So we have to manage the pain part. And then after we've managed pain, we manage the addiction problems. Then we have the doctor shoppers. We, we call these patients the ones who go out for doctor shopping. They are patients who will have consulted multiple healthcare providers to try and get their pain resolved. So there are two issues here. The patient could be having unmet psychological needs. Maybe the pain is not physical. It is psychological, it is social, it is spiritual. So it needs a different intervention from analgesics. Or the patient might be misusing opioids. So try to establish if the patient has overlapping prescriptions of, of pain medications of opioids. Uh, opioids are controlled drugs in our country. So some of these patients who seek uh, the prescriptions from different facilities, sometimes you will receive a call from the pharmacies to confirm whether you are the one who has prescribed the opioids. And if you've not prescribed, please, confirm to the pharmacy that you have not prescribed the opioid because some patients will forge your prescription and some of these patients come with overdose of opioids, which again, those are medical legal issues. And when we identify these doctor shoppers, we need to be able to help them. If it is psychological interventions they need, we refer them for that. If they're misusing opioids, again, we need to give them the support that they need. Elderly patients are the biggest population of people with increased risk of acute pain. They are prone to trauma. They tend to have more surgeries or procedures done on them. And they have degenerative conditions like arthritis. So most of them will present with acute pain. So patients above the age of 65 years have age-related physiological changes. 
the renal function is slowing down, the hepatic function is slowing down, and, and many other changes that will impair how we prescribe their medications. Some of them have cognitive impairment. Some have polypharmacy because they have many comorbidities, so they are having a range of drugs that they are taking. Some have functional impairment. So there is need for us to adjust the doses of medications appropriately. Where patients have renal or hepatic impairment, it is good to consult and know how to adjust the doses of their medication and which medications are absolutely contraindicated in which, uh, which type of diagnosis. Then when we are using NSAIDs for elderly people, we need to be very cautious because again, they are the group that are prone to getting renal failure. So, and then NSAIDs come with side effects of um, GI irritation, ulcers, renal impairment. So we need to be very cautious when we are using NSAIDs in the elderly. For pregnancy, many analgesics are contraindicated. NSAIDs are contraindicated at all stages of pregnancy. Paracetamol is actually the only safe medication and the one that has been studied. When it comes to opioids, opioids are used where risks, I mean, benefits outweigh the risks. So they should be used with caution and in consultation with the obstetricians. The opioids that have been studied in pregnancy, most of the time is methadone that has been used among pregnant women who are addicted to heroin or those who have opioid misuse disorder. So opioids cross the placenta and they're not safe because uh, the fetus is constantly exposed to opioids and they'll be born with a neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is a withdrawal syndrome from, in, from opioids. So we need, when we need to use opioids, it is important that we ascertain at what stage is the gestation what are the risks that we are posing to the unborn fetus? And then what are the risks to the pregnant patient? And what is their history of being exposed to opioids, whether they have been prescribed or not? So we're almost coming to an end. So after we manage the pain, we need to identify the underlying cause and offer disease-specific treatment. So these uh, principles apply generally to managing acute pain, but at the end of the day, it is important to identify why is your patient having pain. So take a detailed medical history, examine the patient. If they say they have abdominal pain, examine and see what is happening. Are they having an appendicitis? Are they likely to have a renal colic? Then send the patient for appropriate investigations. And these investigations include baseline investigations, a total blood count, kidney function, and liver function as standard. Even when we want to use analgesics, we need to know those functions. Then let us establish the underlying cause of illness so that we are able to manage it. Finally, in pain management, we need to talk to the patient. So it is not just enough to prescribe analgesics, but it is important for us to educate the patient. And this education, Starts with us being honest. It is good to tell your patient what you think is causing their pain and how you're going to treat that pain. Then encourage them to have realistic expectations. There's some pain that we cannot eliminate completely. So we need to emphasize that we are focusing on improving the function. That is the primary goal of pain management. So we are not going to take your pain to zero, but we can get you to a level where you are able to walk instead of you groaning in pain the whole day. What are the potential side effects of the medications you're prescribing? It is important for your patient to know. We, it's not that we want to scare them, but it's good for them to be aware that some of the side effects that you might experience from medications are this and that. And some side effects, for example, when we are giving opioids like tramadol, sometimes we give with an antiemetic to prevent the side effect of emesis then what is the likely cause of pain and treatment options? So you can, you've come from an accident and we are identifying you might have a fracture. It is good for us to start telling you at that point where we are managing your pain that we are going to do an X-ray. There's a likelihood you might have a fracture. This fracture can be fixed in theater or you will have a, a POP or an external fixation. You might be bedridden for three months. It is good for us to discuss these things with our patients 
then the potential risks of the underlying condition and any medication that we are prescribing. Then if we are prescribing opioids, we need to tell them how will they store those opioids and how do they dispose. If there is no return policy for unused opioids, what will happen when my pain is gone and I'm not using this medication anymore? What should I do with that medication? Then what is the follow-up plan? So yes, we, we, we've operated on you, we've done an anatomy, we are discussing you home on this pain medication for three, four days, but what is the follow-up plan after that? Supposing the pain does not get better from this charge, where should the patient go? Supposing, again, the, the healing happens as expected, how often do we want to see our patient in clinic? So please remember that we, in assessing acute pain, the aim is to be able to get our patients to a functional level, then to, to identify what is causing the pain, to treat it, and to help the patient up to the healing process. So start by taking a focused history or clinical assessment of the pain, then achieve pain control using the appropriate analgesics, which you will choose based on the severity of the pain and based on the principles that are given by World Health Organization Management Ladder. Then identify the underlying cause and offer disease-specific treatment because that is the only way you can treat acute pain is by treating the underlying condition. Then educate your patient both on their diagnosis, prognosis, and analgesics as well as the side effects. So these are some of the references that I used in making this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Esther. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nafula, for the insightful session. Uh, well uh, outlined, and I like the the last bit that you talked about talking to the patient. So it's not just about uh, diagnosis, di diagnosing and prescribing medication, but patient education is very important when we are talking about pain uh, management. We have a few questions in the Q&A um, and appreciation also for the sessions uh, from participants. I'll not go to the questions on the CPD. I think the KNH team has uh, we would give feedback on that later. Uh, so Dr. Nafula will start off with this question from uh, Esther, who asked uh, who asks about uh, how often does progression from acute to chronic pain through neuromodulation happen? So how often does progression from acute pain to chronic pain through neuromodulation happen? Mm, it, is, it is found to be more, co a, a more common um, a problem or complication of surgery, but it's very, it's minimal. Uh, Dr. Nafula? Yes. You could, okay, we are losing you. Oh, okay, let me sit closer to the yes. screen. Can you hear me now? Yes, that is clear, yes. Yes, I'm saying uh, the transition from a is more, a more common complication of surgery, chronic post-operative -op pain, but again, it is not in very many patients. Just about 10% of patients uh, go to chronic pain because uh, post-surgical pain is often very well managed. So it's just about 10% of the patients. We want to avoid that 10% entirely. All right, thanks. And then maybe we can take these two together. Joseph asks, uh, there's this patient with chronic headache of over three years duration, um, not currently responding to beta pin. Would you have any recommendations on managing this headache? And in line with that, there's a question from Emily. She's asking, can Zulu MR be, be used in long-term management of pain? Okay, uh, any patient with chronic headache, I think needs to be evaluated for the cause of the headache. So as we've said, uh, the aim is to identify the underlying cause. Uh, if my memory serves me right, any headache that was persistent for more than two weeks needed at least bare minimum is a CT scan. So that's a patient who needs to be referred for neurological assessment to ascertain the cause of the headache. 
because headache is a type of neurological pain. Now, when it comes to using Zuluemar, Zuluemar is a combination of acyclofenac and uh, paracetamol. So we do not advocate for use of NSAID for a long time because of the, the side effect profile. So again, please try and refer your patients early for interventional pain management where possible. If it is regional pain, they are better off getting um, regional blocks or nerve blocks as opposed to being on NSAIDs for a long time. So again, ascertain the underlying cause of the problem and see whether that can be managed long term. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We'll have a presentation uh, on chronic pain management. Sorry, we'll have a presentation on chronic pain management that will also address some of these things. I think we are going to do it in the next two months. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Esther. Um, there's a comment from Dorcas, and she says it's crucial to have a central patient registration to prevent uh, doctors, doctor shoppers and uh, drug abuse. So maybe that's something for consideration. However, I don't think we have a centralized um, like patient registration system in Kenya apart mm. from the one I've seen in the HIV field. I don't know if you have a comment on that, Esther. I don't know of any. Actually, that's why I was also asking of, uh, the question if there's any pharmacist maybe who can answer us whether we have an opioid return policy in this country, that if a patient has taken home opioids and they have not consumed all the opioids, what happens? Mm. So in, in, if there's any pharmacist with an answer, they can type as we continue with the discussion. All right, uh, thanks. But the other thing I know is most patients will, with patient education, most of them, or rather the caregivers would uh, bring back the, the used and unused opioid medication. So there's also a lot of awareness that, and education that needs to be done from our end as healthcare providers so that they don't keep those medications when the patient no longer needs them. Um, there is another question on opioid use. How long should, how long should spinal TB pain last post-treatment? Patient has been on opioids for over seven years. Uh, post-treatment of spinal TB. I'm not sure how long the pain should mm -hmm. last, but Seven years sounds like a long time of a patient being on, on opioids. Opioids, yeah. yeah. I would also recommend a review, like if, yeah. they, if they could get to a pain specialist so that they, remember we talked about getting the underlying issue. If it can be managed, that might also improve their quality of life. Okay, so um, I'll take these next two questions together. Though these are, uh, Anonymous attendee who says, what of sicklers who are likely to have crisis? How do you manage their pain? Then in line with that, they, they, there was a question about, um, is it safe to use opioids in children? So you could take those two together. All right. So in, in sicklers, uh, sicklers, with their crisis will often present with severe pain. So we use, we still use the WHO ladder. If their pain is moderate, we would use a weak opioid. If it is severe, we would use a strong opioid. Now, remember, as we said, acute pain follows a pattern where when healing happens, the pain resolves. So even for sicklers, when we are able to manage the crisis, most of them, their pain will go down. So you will typically find at the time of admission, we will start with strong opioids. And by the time of discharge, maybe in three to four days we've managed the crisis and we are able to get them off opioids and we are now on paracetamol. And sometimes they go home even without analgesics. So again, it's to look at what is the kind of crisis the patient is having and manage that crisis so that the pain can go down. All right, uh, thanks. Safety in children, I think we've talked about mm -hmm. that. Yes, uh, opioids are safe for use in children. So we avoid weak opioids because sometimes the metabolites are accumulated. 
So in children less than 12, the preferable opioid of choice is morphine. Yeah, but sometimes depending on the indication, like the children who are sicklers or postoperative, we might still use the moderate opioids, but for a short time. Thank you. Um, so in short, they are, they are safe. I know most healthcare yes. providers are, are not uh, confident or comfortable prescribing things like morphine to children, but we know they relieve their pain. So um, just follow what we've learned today and it should be safe for you. There's a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, uh, patients, maybe it's an ob observation, patients who are on topical uh, steroids, usually those with eczema, tend to be very sensitive to pain. This being noticed, especially when they go for dental procedures. I don't know if you've had an experience with this, Dr. Nafula. I haven't. Not, not really. The patients I have experienced with hyperalgesia, yeah, most of them is uh, the ones on opioids for a long time. But it is something that I can research on. It sounds actually like something interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, someone is asking for the slides. Uh, we are advised mm. that the KNH webinars are usually uploaded on their YouTube uh, channel. So you'd be able to find those in the past meetings uh, for your review. Um, Irene asks, how can we combine opioids with anticonvulsants in chronic pain, e.g. neuropathic pain, while avoiding excessive effects of GABA inhibition, e.g. brain fog, drowsiness, etc., as they decrease the quality of life in a patient? So she's asking about con combination of opioids with uh, things like anticonvulsants. I'm wondering whether I can defer that question to, to Dr. Sorry? I'm asking whether I can defer the question. Dr. Hussein will do the presentation on chronic pain management. Okay, okay. So, Irene, please join us for our. Yes, for the chronic pain, pain. Yes, yes, then we, we can go into details okay. of those analgesics and adjuvants. All right. Um, but remember, Esther talked about the ladder and stepping up and down and their medication like the, the adjuvants and use of these other conventional medications has been safe to use. So we'll, we'll tackle this in depth in the next session. Um, the question on classification of analgesics, I don't know if you want to go over that again. <laughs> yes. How do you so, classify analgesics? Basic, we can classify analgesics as opioids and non-opioids. Then uh, on opioids, we have paracetamol and we have uh, an antiradol and inflammatory drug. Then on the opioids, we have weak and slow opioids. I think that is a general classification that can work. Yes. Otherwise, we would have to go into now details of analysis. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh... An anonymous attendee asks what patients should be on follow-up as an outpatient. And then as you comment on that, um, let us know where the acute pain service is at KNH. <laughs> okay, we do have a, a pain clinic, but right now we are doing more of chronic pain management. We have the anesthesia team that does uh, acute pain management for us but it's on a consultation basis. So whenever patients are in the ward and they need pain management, once we are called upon, we are able to, to involve the anesthesia team from the University of Nairobi to help us with the acute pain management. But we, we hope in future that we'll be able to have a central clinic where patients can get both acute and chronic pain management. Mm -hmm. Uh, what patients should be on follow-up as outpatients? Now, any patients who have pain, for acute pain, if they come to the outpatient unit, it's fine. But we've said now, if their pain is persisting beyond what we expect to be the normal duration of healing or the normal duration of pain for that diagnosis, it is good to refer them to the pain clinic 
We understand there's a limitation of pain clinics in Kenya. So I would advise that we, we refer these patients to the appropriate specialist clinic. For example, if a patient is post-operative and they are coming with pain to the outpatient, then they should be referred to the surgical clinic so that they can be followed up appropriately. Thanks. And of course, our aim is pain control and improving their quality of life. Mm. Uh, the questions on pregnancy and pain, we will uh, answer this when we are doing our session on obstetric pain. So be patient with us and we will handle that. Um, there are these two questions. Uh, there's a question about what are the effects of tramadol use post surgery from Lucy? And then Alex asks if there are uh, alternatives, uh, alternative medications that can be used for an elderly patient with chronic pain with whom opioids affect their breathing. And so what are alternatives are there for an elderly patient with uh, breathing issues because of opioids and then effects of tramadol post-surgery? I think the, the side effects of, of tramadol are the same even post-op. The common side effect is nausea and vomiting, and some patients get constipation. Then there is drowsiness and, and fatigue. Those are the commonest side effects that we experience with trauma. So as I mentioned, sometimes we prevent the nausea and vomiting by giving an anti prior to administration of trauma. Now, when it comes to elderly patients with pain, I think the important thing is to look at the mechanism of pain or rather the diagnosis. What is causing the patient to have pain? Because then that can, can inform which medication you're going to use and that there are any contraindications for NSAIDs or any other medication. Now, if the patient is getting respiratory distress with opioids, the first question is why are they on opioids? Why has it been indicated? Because uh, depending on what the underlying diagnosis is, opioids again have been used to treat dyspnea. For example, in patients with cancer, with lung metastasis, patients with lung cancer who have dyspnea, morphine is the first drug of choice for managing the dyspnea. So we might actually want to know the underlying diagnosis first before we can be able to answer properly whether we can substitute these opioids or how we can manage this elderly person's pain. Thank you. Um, as, we, as we talk about trauma, there's an anonymous attendee who is asking about um, experience with treating neuropathic pain. So mm. she's saying, we sometimes experience patients who have neuropathic pain. The question is you treat them with an opioid and they keep coming back. If you don't give them injectable tramadol, they can't take oral <laughs> tramadol. So maybe you could highlight the correct management of neuropathic pain so that this is cleared. <laughs> okay, so neuropathic pain is actually difficult to manage because it has both the nociceptive pathway and there is uh, damage to nerves. And the nerves take a long time to heal. Sometimes they don't heal. So there is no single analgesic that is able to manage neuropathic pain 100%. Even opioids are thought to just manage 30 to 40% of that pain. That's why we use adjuvants like um, anticonvulsants and uh, antidepressants and steroids. So again, for neuropathic pain, we want to identify if it is regional or not, because long-term, these patients sometimes benefit from uh, interventional pain management. And where that is not possible, the patient has to take a combination of analgesics. So we will give different classes of analgesics depending on the site of the pain and uh, the severity of the pain. And we use adjuvants. It's a must to give adjuvants for neuropathic pain. And patient education, because neuropathic pain is hard to eliminate. And some patients will tell you, I have been taking this medication for a long time and I do not feel any change. Also look at the non-pharmacological pain management. 
what can the patient do to distract them from pain? Do they love to read a book? Do they love music? Do they love gardening? So we also have to look at what, what other techniques can we use to lessen that perception or experience of pain for the patients with neuropathic pain. Hmm. Yeah, so neuropathic nociceptive pain, uh, that's why you need to assess correctly and know which it is so that the management is instituted in the right manner. Uh, but for pain, remember teamwork. So different interventions may work for different patients. Uh, there is a comment about, I don't know if it's from a pharmacist, but saying uh, the medications should just be returned to pharmacy. Then there okay. was a comment about, uh, about it's important to have a post-treatment stroke disposal return policy uh, for narcotic medications so that um, uh, it's disappeared. She's asking about if there are such protocols. So I think the discussion is, it's, there is need to have one. We, I, yeah. I don't know of any, but that is something uh, we would need to consider. Mm. Um, a question on epidural pain. I don't know if you have a comment on that, Dr. Nafula. Please epidural explain pain management. on epidural, yes. <laughs> I will leave epidural that for the experts. I will leave that for yeah. the experts of epidurals. So we'll have a, a session on interventional pain management, and they will take us through epidurals, how they are done, which medications are used. I'm not an expert in that area. That's that's okay. An important question here. Someone talked about beta pain, and there are questions about combination. So. What's your take on combination analgesics, whether separate tablets or one, and also your comment on giving NSAIDs along opiates, alongside opiates? So combination analgesics are good because they give us a multimodal analgesia. They give us different pathways because the analgesics work on different pain pathways. So combination medications are good because they enable us to use lower doses of opioids, because most combinations will be an opioid and an NSAID or an opioid and paracetamol. And then what was the question on NSAIDs? Uh, use of NSAIDs with opioids. With opioids, yes. NSAIDs can be used together with opioids, whether weak or strong opioids. They, they can be used together because NSAIDs work on, uh, on the um, cox cyclooxygenase pathway. So it's about uh, inflammation and opioids will work in the central nervous system. So it is good to combine sometimes when, when we are not achieving pain relief, for example, with one analgesic, we might want to combine so that we see if we are able to address the other pathway of pain before we increase the doses of the medication. All right, uh, what about the uh, chir chir says, say something about ketorolac injection for acute pain management. Ketorolac is an NSAID. Yes. Yes, ketorolac is an NSAID and it can be used for short-term relief of moderate to severe pain. So again, it, it can be, it is a good alternative to opioids in, in acute pain settings. Where ketorolac is available, sometimes it has been used and pain has been relieved and we have not had to use opioids. So it is a safe alternative, but again, because it's an NSAID, we want to use it for short periods of time. All right, then there are questions about chronic pain management and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I think we'll answer them in our next sessions on chronic pain. There's mm. a question on uh, something called kinesotape. I've not heard of that. So what are your comments <laughs> on kinesiotape for pain management? I do not know what that is, yeah. so I do not have a yeah. comment. <laughs> if someone has a comment on that, Mose, please, uh, you could respond to the question on the Q&A box. Um, maybe Esther, you could also give us pointers. We, there are questions on addiction and highlighting addiction. So 
in your experience, uh, what steps would health workers or patients use to avoid addiction in patients using opioids? So uh, I think the point as even from the presentation, first is to, to try and limit exposure of opioids to your patients. So try and, and keep these opioids for as, as sh for short durations of time and at, at low doses. Of course, the rules are a bit different when we are dealing with patients with cancer, especially advanced cancer. But for acute pain, we want to limit the exposure to opioids. Then we want to, to screen our patients for the risk of opioid misuse. And we've looked at some of those questions. Is there family history of mental illness? Does this patient already have a pre-existing problem with opioids? So sometimes we have patients who come and tell us, tramadol works for me, I want tramadol. So before even dismissing the patient and saying maybe they are addicted, or try and find out why are they preferring to use tramadol? Because sometimes just in the history taking and discussion with the patient, we are able to pick up the likelihood of this opioid addiction developing. So patients who already have addiction problems, they have alcoholism, they have mental illness. So they already have history of addiction to other things. They are susceptible. They have family history of mental illness, family history of uh, opioid misuse or other drug abuse. You might want to also follow them up closely. And you, when you assess and you find there's a likelihood of misuse, it's also good to have a mental health assessment early. We do not want to just call in the psychiatry team or the psychology team when now the patient has become addicted, but we should be able to support them from the start. Ah, that is important. And uh, a question from Mose, she, he's asking yes. whether opioids are contraindicated in patients with asthma and in pain. So maybe contraindications of opioids generally, and is asthma a contraindication? But uh, I can't hear you. I'm saying I'm not, I'm not aware whether asthma is one of the contraindications, because uh, for most patients we use with caution in elderly patients, in those with renal or pregnant and pregnancy. But uh, for a smart patient, I am not sure. Okay. Um, I guess here we, we, we also look at uh, if someone already has uh, or rather breathing issues, it's also important to keep monitoring them. Um, yes. So that if, if they need pain relief and that is what is available to you, there are medications like opioids that. Uh, may inadvertently depress the respiratory system. So you just need to monitor closely um, so that you don't cause more side effects. There's a question about uh, how long or how much med opioid medication patients should take home. I think that was going also in line with addiction. Um, I think over time patients are depending on how you are reviewing them, they will receive medicines to last them to the next review while you follow them up in between if they need higher or lower doses. Uh, I don't know if Esther, you have a different opinion on the same. Yes, actually our, our, our guidelines uh, talk about maximum of two. Okay. We, are, we are losing you. I'm saying it's, it's supposed yes. to be a maximum of two weeks in chronic pain. For acute pain, we say we want to keep them on opiates for three to five days. Now, for mm -hmm. chronic pain, our guidelines say they should be reviewed every two weeks. But it, sometimes it is not practical because some of our patients are coming from far. But in KNH, the maximum they get is one month supply of opiates. And these are for patients with chronic pain. And they have to come back to be reassessed before we can refill their opioid prescription. Mm. All right. Uh, someone is helping us. Uh, they're saying kinesotep is a thin, flexible tape meant to relieve pain, reduce inflammation and swelling, and provide support to joints and muscles. 
So uh, attendees, we could read more and find out what uh, that exactly is. Um, Carol also adds, uh, thanks Dr. Carol. The K-tape or kinesiology tape is a flexible tape used by physiotherapists, sports medicine doctors for management of muscle injuries. It requires assessment of the injured athletes to establish whether it will be the most appropriate mode of management of the reported uh, injury. So we have learned something more. Um, yes, non pharmacological <laughs> interventions. Yeah. So, okay, tip. Now, um, more questions on pregnancy, we will answer them later. And then this other question that keeps recurring, uh, do you have any comments on um, management of migraine headaches uh, in patients? I think we need, we need to get a neurologist to teach us about migraine. We will coordinate the research department to organize oh, okay. Okay, then it could also highlight the issues of uh, the questions of head injury and use of opioids as well as other um, injuries in terms of opioid use that affects the nervous system. Uh, there was, I think there was, a, oh yeah, there was a question about use of tramadol in children. We've said that for children we use the either the, the non-opioids or the uh, strong opioids because the weak opioids are not recommended for those under 12. Um, there's a recurring question on use of, oh, side effects of NSAIDs uh, like diclofenac, and then a question on use of diclofenac for pain management. I think Esther has highlighted that. The non-opioids include uh, the end states, then you could highlight in Kenyatta or where you practice, are we still using diclofenac for pain management? And then are we still using pethidine for pain management? All right, now um, we are still using diclofenac for pain management because again, uh, when it comes to availability of opioids, look at what is available in your formulary within your institution. So diclofenac, just like any other NSAID, the side effect profile is the same. And uh, the issues around diclofenac use came up with cardiotoxicity claims. And uh, recent research has shown that the cardiac effects are similar for, for all the opioids. So patients who are on diuretics, patients who are on for depression can develop by being on opioid use and the ones who are on diuretics or uh, diuretics, they develop water retention, So we are losing you, Esther. Sorry. I'm saying you need to look at the profile of your patient to know whether diclofenac is safe for them. Then when it comes to pethidine, Pethidine has been linked with a lot of addiction. Uh, it is still being used in the country, in KNH and in government institutions, we are not using it, but in the private sector, we are still using it. Okay, so the Kenya Essential Medicines East has also removed uh, pethidine from using pain management because of the reasons she has highlighted as well as the side effects because it has neuropsychiatric uh, effects. Um, so my, the last comment that, thanks Tessa for highlighting that, it's not only gabapentin that can be used for neuropathic pain, but we also have things like amitriptyline. So as we read more about adjuvants, that is something uh, we can uh, focus on. So thanks everyone. Thanks for the insightful questions. I think we've we've answered we've answered most of what was related to this session or to today's session. Thanks, Dr. Nafula, for your time and the engagement by the participants. Um, just to remind us, we'll be having more pain uh, sessions 
next month is a session each month. So we've had the, the April one, the next one will be on 10th May. So look out for that. Um, even as we look at pain engagement, we have the palliative conference coming up in November. So look out for updates uh, from Kepka for that so that you can engage and learn further from each other. So I'll stop there. There's the highlight of tomorrow's session on nursing care in Ostomy uh, at two o'clock. So please join in tomorrow as we learn about uh, caring for stomas. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if the education and research team have any comments, but that's it from us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for attendance. Uh, I've noted there are some complaints about CPD points. Please uh, send your email to kenhresearch at gmail.com uh, with the sessions where you've not received CPD points. But we are trying also to coordinate so that we ensure that you get your CPD points for all the sessions you've attended. And please note that you need to attend at least 30 minutes of a session before you qualify for CPD points. Thank you very much for your time. Have a lovely afternoon. See you next month. We'll be discussing pain management in pregnancy.